Good morning and welcome back to Serial Science. It's Bite Size Science for the Curious. Uh, so every week we have an Ask Me Anything with an Awesome Science guest. It's basically your Saturday morning cartoons and cereal, but it is on Wednesdays and it's with science. So if you tuned in last week, we talked to Erin Fairweather, uh, everything about ants and their crazy superpowers, how ants are super strong, they're great at communicating, all the, all the wild things that they do to, uh, to, to survive and protect their, their colonies. So we're going to continue on with that super theme, uh, and we're going to talk about superhero costumes. We have a textile scientist with us, and you know every superhero has a costume. Mm. Uh, they have crazy properties. They, um, there are capes that fly. There are uh, they repel bullets. Some of them emit force fields. Uh, but in real life, we have amazing super costumes as well. So super fabrics, I mean. So we have Kevlar. If you have ever gone scuba diving, you know there's all these crazy materials that keep us warm or cool or protected. Um, you know. Uh, astronauts and spacesuits. So there are a lot of very real uh, super fabrics. So we're gonna talk to Mary Glasper. Mary is a textile scientist with Arcteryx. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk to you about uh, all things super fabrics. So um, I kind of mentioned a few of them, but like what, what do you think some super fabrics would be? You work for Arcteryx, which makes uh, technical gear and very like kind of you know outdoor protect you from the elements type stuff but I think there's a lot of super fabrics. Yes um, so I currently work for an outdoor brand absolutely um, and in my past I've also worked in protective clothing and and other things so so I've got I've done a, a bit of work with with cool protective clothing in in my life. Um, I think Probably the least glamorous, but the most important super fabric uh, to start off with is spandex. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's like, yes. Like racing so, jerseys and you know what you wear to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I can show you a quick. Uh, I'll show you some quick visuals just uh, just for people to see here. Can you see my screen? Yes, definitely. Wonderful. So when you think of superheroes, um, I think. Oops, sorry, I started from. The wrong slide here we go so um i feel like spandex knits are like one of the most important fabrics for superheroes um if you picture yeah. being able to actually bend and do all these cool moves and everything movement is super important and having mm -hmm. your, your fabric actually fit your body very tightly is also really important yeah. so um i know it's not very exciting and we'll get into some cooler stuff but how that's how that works is usually um superhero costumes are made from what we call knitted fabrics so um, I don't know if, if you can, maybe I'll do a laser pointer here. Ooh, can mm -hmm. you see that? Yeah. So if you see this red, this red yarn here that's highlighted, this is a very basic knitted structure. And how it's created is just by rows and rows of yarns that are looping in on itself. And so that allows the fabric to really stretch and bend quite easily. And then on top of that, usually these, these costumes, the yarns are made with having um, the core is actually spandex, the stretchy part, and then that spandex is wrapped with a different material, usually nylon, something that's uh -huh. a bit more durable, mm -hmm. and then that, so you've got the stretch there, and then you've got the stretch from the fabric, and so that really allows you to uh, do all your cool kung fu moves and take out <laughs> take out bad guys. So. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, and I, I love that you, uh, I love that you have a picture of uh, of Spider-Man, and uh, you know, he's always kind of getting into his costume, and he has is a pretty cool new one for the for the newer movies. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and so you always see Spider-Man, you know, shooting webs. That's a very, you know, that's not his costume per se, but that is also another cool material. Absolutely. Um, so when you're talking about Spider, like Spider-Man and his silk, I'll just I have another. If you picture that as kind of like, um, I did it again. I'm sorry. Just one second. Ah, there we go. Okay. So if you picture Spider-Man's rope, it's basically like a climbing rope. So for any of you who have gone climbing, you know, when people are uh, either on the mountain or in a gym, they have 
they have this climbing setup um, where you've got your harness here and uh, and you have this rope here. So what this rope does is you'll see as the as the person makes their way up the wall, they hook themselves into these carabiners and that's basically like a safety line. And so what happens if they fall, then the rope will catch them. But what's neat about about ropes like this is you don't actually you want them to have a bit of stretch, which maybe sounds a little scary to start off with. Yeah. But, but you want it to have a bit of stretch because if the if the rope didn't have any stretch whatsoever, you would drop and then all of your body weight would be on just this harness right here. Oh and that, yeah. And that could really hurt you. So yeah. If, so if you have rope that's got a bit of stretch to it, that can help absorb that force and can help you kind of um can help distribute that force and then you won't injure yourself as badly. It's still it will probably still hurt a bit, but it won't hurt nearly as much as if it didn't have any stretch. So this right here, if you've ever wondered what's inside a rope, this is kind of what the guts of a rope look like. So you've got this outer, yeah, you have this outer protective casing, but then on the inside you've got many other yarns here and those are the usually the part that have a bit of stretch to it. It looks actually um, like a few ropes kind of in one together. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so if we were to get into like a bit more hardcore science here, um, <laughs> what's neat about silk. So I studied silk for my master's degree. So like this is an issue that's close to my heart. This is a diagram. This is what we call um, stress strength, stress strain curves. So whenever you're looking at a diagram like this, you have the strength of a material on the Y axis here. And then you have the stretch on the X axis here. So what you have, so um, something like Kevlar, which we can talk about in a second, is a really, really strong textile fiber, but it's quite brittle. So it's got a lot of strength if you pull it this way, but you can actually, it can, it can break fairly easily if you really? bend you it. Crack yeah. Kevlar? And it, and it doesn't stretch really at all. Um, it's what we call highly crystalline. It's very, very strong, but it's quite brittle. Um, versus something like spandex, which we just talked about, which is really, really stretchy, but it doesn't really have a lot of strength. This yeah. is where you want to get into something here, like spider silk, which is a really exciting material that a lot of people research because it has strength and stretch. So it's acting kind of like that climbing rope where you have something that it can extend quite a bit before it breaks. Um, but that ultimate strength, I mean, while it's not quite as strong as Kevlar, it's still quite strong. Um, so this is what we call toughness. So when people are like spider silk is stronger than steel uh, in some instances, perhaps, but really what they're getting at is that spider silk is tougher than steel, which means okay. it has what we call a high work of rupture, um, <laughs> or that it takes a lot of energy to break that fiber. Okay. Um, so, so these are some, oh, I forgot to have these visuals here. These, so these are some like food analogies I use to describe this. So something like Kevlar would be like a candy stick where it's very strong if you pulled it, but you can, but it, it doesn't have a lot of bend to it, um, versus something like gum. <laughs> and then, so <laughs> very like fruit, yep. fruit leather is kind of what you're going for. Oh, okay. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Spider-Man's silk really would be able to like, let him kind of shoot between buildings and like kind of do his like loop to loop move off move off of the the street lamps. Yes, especially if he's attaching to something and jumping off of like a roof onto something else. Oh. You want that rope to have a bit of give. Oh yeah, for sure. If, yeah. If it it didn't to... have any stretch, that would be very painful for Spider-Man. <laughs> um so we got a question uh so we've talked about about uh Spider-Man and what what fabrics would work for someone like Aquaman? Okay. So underwater, so, underwater fabrics. Yes. So if we're talking about underwater fabrics, um, I think usually people think of um, kind of wetsuits or dry suits. So when we're talking about being underwater, one of the key things you're looking for is warmth. It's insulation. So um, I'm sure people have noticed you go down to the beach, it's say it's, you know, 25 degrees Celsius. It's not super warm, but it's like you're comfortable enough in the air just in your bathing suit. But say you go into the water and that water is 20 or 25 degrees Celsius because that water temperature is lower than your body temperature. You get cold. You feel cold quite quickly. Um, so with water, um, it can it pulls it kind of pulls your body heat. It sucks um, it out of you. Yeah, it sucks it out of you. <laughs> so, so 
if you're going to be underwater for a long period of time, generally it's a good idea to try to have some insulation there to protect to protect your body heat. So in the case of a wetsuit, which is this gentleman in the bottom right hand corner here, uh, looks like he's about to do a triathlon perhaps or some kind of swimming race. Mm -hmm. um, it's called a wetsuit because it's not actually meant to keep yourself dry. The water still gets in. But what a wetsuit fabric looks like is these fabrics here where you've got... Um, looks like you have a couple layers here. Yeah, so you've got you've got one layer. So you've got this is basically a knitted a knitted fabric on this outside. Usually it's something out of nylon, and then on the inside you've got that as well. And then here, right sandwiched in the middle, is a material you may have heard of called neoprene. Oh, so yeah, that's that kind of that's soft. It's a, it's a foam. It's like a synthetic yeah. rubber foam. Okay. And so what that does is it's it's what we call a closed cell foam. So a closed cell structure, meaning it's not like a kitchen sponge. It's got right. lots of holes in it, but they're all um, encapsulated, like they're separated from the outside world so that the water doesn't get into it. And so the idea there is that that foam holds, so air is a really good insulator. Um, so it holds air in those cells. And then that is a good barrier, a thermal barrier between your skin and the water. So even though um, you're underwater, you have sort of like this little micro layer of, of air with you under your, under your suit. Yes, exactly. Um, and then generally, this is also made so the neoprene has a bit of give to it. And then you use knitted fabrics as well so that you can still stretch and move. Not as much as Spider-Man costume, <laughs> perhaps. But Yeah, but. I've definitely been in a wetsuit. It's not, you know, I wouldn't <laughs> do gymnastics. No, no, it's it, it's very, it's usually quite tight. And mm -hmm. it needs to be tight and to your skin so that it's actually doing its job. Because if it was loose, the water would just be getting in there and it wouldn't be doing what it's supposed to be doing anyway. For sure. um, and then on the top right corner here, I've got a picture of a dry suit. And so if a wetsuit means your skin gets wet, a dry suit means you're basically trying to avoid getting wet. So in this case, this is something where you would you would use a dry suit in situations where maybe there's something in the water that you don't want to be exposed to, or it's going to be a fair amount colder, or you're going to be in there for a lot longer. Either way, whatever your reasons are, you're trying to avoid getting any water into the suit. Um, so you've got these like intense waterproof zippers here that are usually oh, rated yeah. that are they usually rated for yeah. certain depths. Yeah. And then here you've got all kinds of things that are hooked up to the suit to regulate the pressure. Cause if you're going to go quite deep, um, you need to be able to regulate the pressure inside of the suit as well. Yeah, um, really. What's nice about dry suits is that you can also wear additional layers of insulation underneath. So you can wear what we call base layers or first layers. So usually like a knitted fabric next to skin that also helps with moisture management and insulation and those kinds of things. You'd have a whole it's kind of like series of, <laughs> so yes. uh, we have a question. So it's kind of about where we were talking, we started off talking about spandex. Um, so where is, uh, where is spandex made? Do we make spandex in Canada? Like, is it, where does this stuff come from? That's a good question. I don't actually know if we still make any spandex in Canada. I think these days, most, uh, most synthetic fibers are produced, um, there might be some that's still made in Canada. There's definitely some that are made in the US um, and across Asia and in um, and in Europe. For sure. They're still, yeah, kind of your main kind of textile production centers. So we've talked about kind of these like these these crazy fabrics that you'd wear uh, sort of underwater. Um, we talked about Kevlar and you know what are of these? What is the most durable textile? Like, do these last for a really long time? Um, do they eventually break down? Like, how long does that? How long does that take? How long do you get to keep your wetsuit for? Yeah, the question of durability is it's kind of a loaded one because durability it's like durability to what? There's I think um, just as superheroes you know have their kryptonite, like Superman has kryptonite. Every material, there is no like perfect material that has no weaknesses whatsoever. So it really depends on what you're talking about. So we were talking about Kevlar earlier, which is a super strong fabric. It's used for bulletproof vests. Um, we can talk more about that in a second if you'd like. But unfortunately, it's really vulnerable to UV degradation. So if it's, if it's exposed to sunlight, it can become quite weak. Um, and it's also vulnerable to uh, moisture. So if really? it's used, yeah, so if it's used in a bulletproof vest, uh, you have to actually protect it from your sweat. And so it's usually <laughs> made, it's usually in, encased in, in like coated, like heavily coated waterproof fabrics to try to keep, to try to protect the Kevlar. Oh, wow. That's wild. So it's like, it can protect you from bullets, but it can't protect you from the outdoors at all. Like the rain. Right. <laughs> right. And Kevlar is used in some outdoor materials, but at uh, 
uh, but usually you have to either coat the yarns with something that protects it from UV or it's, or it's wrapped. Like I was showing you earlier with that, what we call core spun yarn, where it, the, it, the core might be Kevlar and that's wrapped with something protective or it's used, Kevlar is actually used in tires as like a reinforcing material. And of course like it's not exposed. Like, yeah. In like rubber in tires. Really? Yeah. Um, and so it's not exposed to sunlight in that situation. So it's, oh, okay. um, you know, and it's, and if it's in the tire, it's not exposed to moisture for the most part, unless you have like a puncture, but yeah, for yeah, sure. That's the least of your problems. Then. There's something you about puncture. Kevlar actually. So a lot of superhero costumes will repel bullets, but we kind of have this technology ourselves a, a little bit. Um, yeah. How does Kevlar work? Yes. So let me just share my screen with you again. Um, if we have a look here, so, um, I have this like old timey photo of these guys testing a bulletproof vest. Oh man, but, that, that is a yeah. great volunteer. I don't know if I would, <laughs> I don't know if I would no. volunteer for that. No, that's not for me. Um, so this right here is actually um, a diagram of Kevlar structure. Uh, it's, it's what we call, it's highly crystalline, which means that it's got, it's very um, structured, I guess, the polymer, at the polymer level, it's very, very structured and, and stiff and hard, which is, which is great for its strength. Um, as I said earlier, it is a bit, it is a bit brittle. So um, I feel like ideally, like the most ideal bulletproof vest material would be something that's kind of on the tougher end, like we were talking okay. about with spider silk. And there's okay. a lot of research happening kind of in that, in that vein. Um, but how Kevlar works in a bulletproof vest or a ballistic protection situation, this is actually a bunch of Kevlar used. Um, this is, I believe, a test done on a space a vehicle where they have Kevlar as a reinforcing agent to help protect against space debris, kind of puncturing, puncturing a space vehicle. That's a big thing once you're once you're in oh, orbit. Can't repair. Um, yes. So, but the the idea is the same. So you just have multiple layers of of woven Kevlar fabric. So it's not just one layer of fabric and Bob's your uncle, you're okay. good to go. It's that like it's like 10, up. 15, 20 layers of woven fabric. Um, and the idea is that as the as the bullet goes through those successive layers of fabric, it disperses the energy and slows the bullet down so that by the time it's closer to your skin, it stops. Oh. Um, so you're still you might you'll still get a gnarly bruise. Yeah. <laughs> if you were, but I mean it's better than the alternative for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, question from from kind of the floor. So in that sort of bulletproof vest example, there's there's tons of uh, layers of of this Kevlar fabric. Um, do you know how close these cells are to each other or like the little kind of those crystalline structures that you mentioned? Are, are oh, these like, like, like yeah. how are we talking? Yeah, so what I'm talking about crystalline structures, I'm talking at like the polymer level. So like mm. the chemistry of the fiber. Mm -hmm. So this is like, Super, super. This is like nano scale. Yeah, okay, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But that. as you can see here, it's it's a very densely woven fabric, so it needs you need. There's not a lot of like gaps. You wouldn't want to yeah, have you know, like, cheesecloth, you know. <laughs> so we're this is uh, this is an example from some um, you mentioned for the space vehicle testing. So let's talk a little bit about. Uh, space costumes what astronauts wear what yes. what kind of fabrics go into a spacesuit i imagine like there's like there's lots of layers and like they're they look really big and bulky but absolutely um let me just pull that up for you there's a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah this as you can imagine um space is um it's a bit of a hostile environment Exceedingly hostile, yeah. So Exceedingly hostile. Not just, uh, not just uh, cold and wet. Well, actually, not wet at all. But yeah, lots, uh, lots going on. Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess I'm just gonna do this. Oh, hey, these are the crystalline regions I was talking about. So, oh, okay. <laughs> quick, a quick side note. Quick aside. Um, <laughs> if you're looking at this again, this is like super, super zoomed in uh, at the nice. nanoscale. Yeah. But you have what we call amorphous regions where you just have chains of polymer. So that's like different atoms connected together that are just kind of loose like like spaghetti. And then you have areas where due to kind of attractions between those polymer chains, you have these areas that are called crystalline um, where it's it's. Yeah. So if you pictured like co a cotton ball, that would be like an amorphous thing versus mm -hmm. if you had like a handful of spaghetti and oh, you're trying, yeah. to, trying to break it. That's kind of the analogy that I use. So if you have them where they're all tightly, 
they're close together and they're what we call well aligned like they're all facing the same direction like in these guys you have something that's very crystalline whereas in this case you have they're all kind of randomly loosey-goosey you won't have as much strength that way for sure and i imagine so. for like a spacesuit you probably need a combination of these things like some that are very yes and like, oh man that's a lot how many there's a lot there's a lot <laughs> so so it's so when you're in space you basically have to like transport an atmosphere with you mm -hmm. while also dealing with all of the basic things like thermal man management moisture yep. management being warm staying um, dry <laughs> like all the basic kind of like needs that you need that are sometimes difficult to meet all at once when you're on earth never mind yeah. when you're in space <laughs> so so here's an example this is this is just um this is a dupont ad from years and years ago where you can it see like pretty 60s yeah yeah they're going through all of the different DuPont materials they use. So you've got Teflon fabric. Teflon is what we call PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene, oh. um, which is which is what's used on like nonstick coatings on pans, for example. Okay, yeah, you're frank. Um, yeah, and Teflon fabric is very, um, Teflon is actually, that's what Gore-Tex membranes are made out of as well. Okay. Um, it's very waterproof. Mm -hmm. um and and it provides a bit of breathability there and it's in an it's it's heat resistant for sure so um, this is their outer layer or one of the many outer layers yes um you've got here you've got fiberglass you've got aluminized capton you've got you know, neoprene neoprene coated nylon oh, yeah. we talked about <laughs> that um you've got uh nomex which is related to kevlar it's another they're in the same kind of family of materials called aramids um Protective. Lycra is a brand name of spandex. Oh, okay, um, yeah. It's spandex uh, everywhere. Even yeah, <laughs> spandex actually used to be a trade name, but because so el elastane is actually like the proper name for that, but everyone knows it as spandex, so we just say that. Kind of like Kleenex. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Or like hacky sack or things like that, band aids. Um, but just to kind of dive in a little bit deeper, so so. If you picture that you say someone's going on like a spacewalk or they're on the moon, you're mm -hmm. you're going to be in that spacesuit for like twelve hours, <laughs> like a very 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 long periods of time. So so usually the astronauts are wearing like a diaper effectively, and they have oh, okay, yep, can they can't have? Easy. Yeah, I mean if you think it about off. it, it's, it's not like you can take it off to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can see this gentleman's wearing um like a basic what we base layer probably made out of some it might be wool based but it's probably synthetic it might be um polyester or just like or, what you're um, seeing yeah exactly exactly um and then he's got this get up on top which is this really interesting kind of cooling garment so if you're if you're in this really big spacesuit it takes even if you're at zero gravity and imagine it takes a lot of energy just to even just move your arms um and that you exert a lot of energy that way um, and so one way to try to keep you cool is you have this cooling undergarment where um, it's fed with water and these tubes are all over the place. They're kind of, um, they're, you can see where all of this zigzag stitching is. That's yeah. where it's He's got some all of these piping tubes. of water along him. Yeah. And so then they're just piping. It's like a very basic kind of like heat exchange situation um, where, where there's tubes, 91 and a half meters of tubes all around your body that are helping you um, keep cool. And then the fabric itself is also made out of some what we call wicking material, which means it absorbs the water and then spreads it out so that it can increase surface area for evaporation. That's awesome. And we have a kind of a question from the from the floor, or maybe like a more of a comment, but so this is, they have these, uh, this cooling piping all over their body. They're wearing these huge bulky suits. But if you go out on a, on a spacewalk and you have to do something with your hands, you have to fix something or like the whole reason you're out outside is doing something. How does a, how does it work for the gloves? Is, is that something that's, else? That's also? a good question. Um, I don't have a lot of info on the gloves. I think that they um, you can see the gloves here. I mean, they, they don't look particularly. It's, I feel like you don't have a lot of dexterity with these gloves. Yeah, um, Big. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine that the gloves themselves are actually made of very similar kind of layers of material, maybe not quite so many layers so that they can sure. maintain just a little lighter, some kind of dexterity. Um, but you definitely need to have like that, like kind of some kind of impact protective outer layer and then um, insulation and kind of like a like a moisture barrier as well in there. Sure. So you still need yeah. all the same sort of functions. It just has to be even tighter and smaller so that your your fingers can go through it. 
yeah gloves gloves are really tricky <laughs> oh I bet, I bet. Uh, yeah yeah so we're uh, we're just about out of time it's almost 10 o'clock so I actually want to ask you so we've talked about superheroes and uh, costumes but you know every superhero also has an origin story so oh, yes what's what's your origin <laughs> story as a as a scientist how did you how did you get into textiles and uh, uh, and kind of Kevlar and designing all these crazy things? Yeah, so I feel like my origin story is probably a bit different from most textile scientists. I actually study biology, um, Ooh, okay. so I have I have a degree in biology with a minor in textiles, and then I have a master's degree in textile science. Um, so it's here. I actually used to work. I'm from Edmonton um, originally. I, work, I live in Vancouver now. Um, I used to work at the Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton that has a live bug gallery. Um, okay. So yeah, <laughs> so last week, so this is perfect. Amazing. So and I used to so I used to do all this interactive. Um, stuff with 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 people in the gallery holding stick bugs and collecting insects and and doing this but basically with with bugs for 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 students and people who are visiting uh the museum that's awesome that looks like a huge cricket there or something or this one yeah this is a mcclay specter stick Um, oh my goodness yeah it's a type of stick insect they're lovely um and i've actually always done textiles as a hobby um my mom was a big sewer so like I started knitting and crocheting I think I was in grade two <laughs> I started crocheting and then embroidery and all that stuff I'm still doing it I was just showing Sunita something that I was making this weekend I've been knitting yeah, for sure. so, um, knitting. um so like sewing and all that's always been an interest of mine but I didn't really consider that it could be like a career path and I knew I wanted to do science and so I always just thought that like you could only be a fashion designer if you were working I get that a lot if I say that I work yeah, in textiles, totally. people are like, wait, so you're a fashion designer? I'm like, no, 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 no. Sure. <laughs> I do science. Um, and so I discovered that you could actually do textile science. And so it just happened that a friend of mine told me about classes you could take at the University of Alberta. Um, and so I took I took a class and I was just absolutely hooked. I was like, yes, this is this is what I want to be doing. So <laughs> so then I got a job in um, a protective clothing lab. So this is me lighting stuff on fire, which is, you know, pretty cool. Always and fun. um yeah and this is this doesn't want to like fire right. at work <laughs> no and then this on the top right is me doing my master's research so I studied silk as part of my master's so that I could combine the insects and the textile science yes, and, so. absolutely no yeah. that, that's fabulous well thank you uh so much for joining us and uh answering all our wild questions about superhero costumes and fabrics um and uh yeah so uh, next week, um, so it's great that we're talking about uh, spacesuits, actually, because next week for Serial Science, we are going to uh, be talking to scientists about space radiation and, uh, you know, can it give you superpowers? Can it maybe kill you? You know, I think we know some of those answers, but um, yeah, so we're going to next week um, on Wednesday, we're going to be talking about uh, space radiation with Natalie Ouellette. So tune in for that. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mary, for, for joining us. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank you.